so be it. And so as we pray that prayer and we walk through that prayer together this semester, it continues to challenge us. We've had the preaching team walking us and calling us to hear each line and the depth and the breadth of those lines of our Father who art in heaven, this intimate relationship. Hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name and may I reflect that holiness. Thy kingdom come on earth here, earth being on earth across our globe as it is in heaven, and thy will be done as it is in heaven. This amazing, amazing beginning of the prayer, and now we come to what one commentator says, we move from these thou petitions into this we petitions, in which we have been called to remember this amazing, intimate God who loves us and parents us and knows us and calls us to know him, We've been called to think bigger than we might with our narrow vision to see that we desire that God's kingdom would come and that God's will would be done. But it also is this profound permission given to us in this prayer to then say, and here we are, give us this day our daily bread. And for the first audience, the disciples that Jesus brought this prayer to when they asked, how do you teach us to pray? When they came to this line, give us this day our daily bread, they would have instantly understood a breath of what that prayer meant, a breath of what that prayer called them into, because they would have known the Exodus story. They would have known about the story of the manna. So just to kind of recap a little bit of the story, Exodus, second book in our Old Testament, we are told the story of the Israelites who originally were brought to Egypt as a promise in a famine, and they were cared for, and they were beloved within that community. But then over time, over time, they became to be a hated community. The Pharaoh no longer uh, trusted them, and in fact, enslaved them and crushed them and oppressed them and sought to destroy them and use them and abuse them. And so I won't get into all the details of the story, but God brings Moses to them and through a whole bunch of miracles and works within their lives, eventually they're released and Moses brings them to the Red Sea. And if you remember this kind of iconic moment in which the sea is parted, and the Israelites pass through. And that as they pass through, that they, um, the Egyptians had changed their mind and the army came after them. And as the army entered into that, that sea closed up. And a people who once were enslaved were now free. A people who once were oppressed have a new life. A people who felt far from God now were invited into this intimate journey with God. Three days, three days, I said two right there, three days into the journey, three days into this journey, they began to complain and grumble. Three days after all this miraculous happening, they begin to grumble and not speak to God about it, but to Moses and say, we're dying of thirst. And in three days, it's such an interesting part of the story, they come to a place called bitter. Mara is the word for that. They come to this place called bitter. And Moses 15.25 says, Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. And in this miraculous moment where now they receive sweet water, they're refreshed, they're renewed, God kind of does one of those moments, I don't know if your parents ever did this, where they're like, look me in the eye. Like, I really want you to listen now. This is important. Look me in the eye. Which is, and then God says, you're my people. If you'll listen to me, if you'll walk with me, if you'll follow me, then we will have this life together, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. Do you get that? We just gave you fresh waters. Look me in the eye. So they journey on. A month and a half in, 
walking through this desert. And they begin to complain and grumble again. And again, they're not turning to God who has said, we're in this, listen, let's, let's share life together. They turn to Moses and begin to complain. And they begin to talk about their deep hunger, their desire for this bread, for food, and that they're disappointed in this journey. And what I find so interesting is what they also begin to do is reflect on Egypt in a whole other way. This place where they had been profoundly oppressed, enslaved, their children destroyed, they were in great pain. But this is what they say to Moses. There, Egypt, we sat around pots of meat and ate food all the day we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Moses, you have done an awful thing by leading us to this place. So we pause for a moment as we connect kind of our own lives into these lives of this Exodus story, as we recognize that we too have been on journeys in which we get to places called bitter. Because we've followed God, we've walked with God, we've moved in directions, and then we find that it's not working out quite how we thought it should. The things aren't falling into place quite like we thought they should. There's tough things to struggle with, and there's real physical needs in this new place. And we begin to complain. And like the Israelites, sometimes we even forget to move into a conversation with God and begin just to complain and allow bitterness to grow deeper into our beings. It's interesting that there's a correlation that a lot of theologians make between the Red Sea and the, and the walking through the Red Sea and our baptism. That in a similar sense, we are a people who once were oppressed and brought into the waters and made free. That we are people who once were enslaved and brought into the waters and set forth into being a people who are called sons and daughters of God. That there's this, this correlation here and there is this correlation in our propensity to enter into the places called bitter. I've been there. I, I've had those experiences where I've trusted God, I've heard God, I've walked with God. And then when I land in that new place, whether it's physically a new place or vocationally a new place or relationally a new place, and it begins hard, I wonder if God forgot that he sent me to a new address. And I ask those questions and I complain about them. And then we have this other tendency that we see in them, which is to be a people that even as we're walking, we start walking with our head turned around to where we once were. And what happens when we do that is our vision is really like crazy distorted. So I look back to where I left, and now what I begin to talk about is only kind of the best of the days when everything was good and wonderful. I don't, I don't remember any of the things that called me to make this move. I just, I just begin to see kind of what they do. Egypt, this place where we ate meat all day. Like that is not the story. If you read Exodus, that is not the reality of Egypt. And yet that is what they're remembering. And the other thing that happens is I don't have a vision for what God is bringing right into this moment and bringing me into, because I'm not looking to where God is guiding me anymore. I'm doing this looking back journey. And you end up with a distorted vision. And if you walk with your head turned around, you fall. And if you walk with your head turned around, you get a strained neck. But here's the reality, is all of us have moments and times where all we do is want our bread. We love it, we want to be filled with it, we want abundance, we don't want to have to worry about it, we want our bread. Perhaps particularly uh, similar to our friend Oprah. <laughs> I'm now just managing, so I don't deny myself bread, I'm bread every day. I have bread every day. <laughs> I love bread. I do too. 
I love bread. I love all kinds of bread. I like abundance of bread. Any bread lovers out there? Same. All right. <laughs> The Israelites are bread lovers. They love their bread. And they want it. And so this is what we see. Let's look a little bit in the 16th chapter of Exodus. In this complaining, in this desire for bread. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for the day. And that way I will test them, because he's still wanting them to learn to listen and to walk with him. I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. And then it goes on because God is wanting to do more than just fill their stomachs. He's wanting them to begin to understand when they bring their needs before God, how God wants to provide, but also what that means in the community in which they dwell. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, so they got meat at night. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. And when the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is it? Which is the actual meaning for manna. When you say manna, you're saying, what is it? Which is just great. It's just great that this becomes our symbol of God's provision for us, that we would have manna. It is the way that God answers to prayer always surprises us. And it comes in different ways than we thought. And often we will say, what is it? What is it? But Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. It's God's answer. It's God's provision. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each of you needs and omer to a person according to the number of all persons providing for those in your tent. The Israelites did so, some gathering more, some gathering less. But when they measured it, each of them had an omer, which I think is just so interesting. That those who had the capability of gathering a whole bunch and those who didn't have that ability to gather as much each of them ended up with the same amount, which was enough for that day. Enough for that day. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over until morning. But they did not listen. Some left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and became foul. Or, as another version said, it got maggots and it stunk. I, like, I think that feels more expressive to me. Filled with maggots and it stunk. So this, this image that as we ask God to provide, we're not to hoard it. We're called into this naming to God, receiving from God, trusting God, and not hoard it. And if we start to hoard it, it gets maggots and it stinks. But they did not listen and they left part of it and it bred worms and became foul. But they begin to do this rhythm that you see. You begin to see this rhythm in which they learn to trust, to gather just enough, receive what God has, and trust for the next day that God will provide. And then it goes further on and it talks about on the Sabbath, the night before the Sabbath, that time you can gather more because you can gather it for the next day because God is also establishing this rhythm of trust and rest in God in where you actually take a full day off. And don't even go to the fields. But some of them went to the fields and found nothing. And again, God is saying, listen, walk with me. I'm your God. Our Father who art in heaven is wanting to walk and provide for us. 
And so we have this story of this manna, this what is it that provides for them in this journey. And then it moves into this kind of remembrance story, which is always interesting because that's, that's written across a lot of our communion tables in remembrance of me. Remember this provision that God has brought to you. The house of, of Israel called it manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations in order that you may see the food with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when the disciples hear, give us this day our daily bread, whoom. The manna story is right there. That this is the God who provides. That this is the God who calls us to rest. That this is the God who wants us to walk with him and talk with him. This line is an invitation to receive, to share, to rest in God's provision. It's a prayer that calls us to be honest before God with our hands and say, oh, I'm going to name the things I'm anxious about. I'm going to name the places of great need where I don't know how I'll pay that bill, how I'll have money for rent, how I'll have food to eat. It's, it's an invitation for us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And name those things before God, honestly and fully. And it's also, give us this day our daily bread. Praying for our world. For all the places in which we're called to enter and all the places we can't imagine how we can be part of the response of the need. Give us this day our daily bread. And sometimes when we're praying, give us this day our daily bread, and we begin to name all the things that we're anxious about and worried about, sometimes God brings a corrective and say, you're kind of asking for more than an omer there. You're asking for wants, not for actually what, you're, what you need. So I want you to, to bring that prayer for me again. In the light of praying for God's kingdom to come and God's will to be done, and sometimes when we bring that before God, God will say, you have extra. I want you to share that with others. Because the give us this day our daily bread, if you've journeyed that, there are times when I've been the, the receiver of a miracle in the way God has provided. And there's been times when I've been nudged by God to be part of the offering to another. So three stories. One is the family story that's been passed on to me for years, which is of my grandfather, who was very poor, early in his life was a, a mill worker, came to know Christ in a powerful way, and was part of his church. And one day, he was up at the altar praying. And another guy from the church showed up and joined him at the prayer with a shoebox. And the guy said, Brother James, that's how they kind of referred to them, each other that, in those days, I was walking by a shoe store this week, and I sensed God saying, go in and buy a pair of shoes. Had an argument with God, I don't need shoes, and he said, go buy shoes. He enters into that shoe store and senses God saying, buy this size, which is not his size. And that as he was sitting in church and saw my grandfather praying at the altar, what he saw were the holes in my grandfather's shoes. The shoes were exactly the size that my grandfather needed. Give us this day our daily bread. A friend of mine was just sharing with me last week about a time and a season in her life where they had no money, expecting a baby, needing a crib, kind of on their way to find maybe a cheap crib, and as they walked out the door, picked up an envelope that had come from her parents. When they opened it up, it had this weird amount for this check. 
And then when they got to the store, the crib that they were going to buy, uh, long story, wasn't available. They ended up with a completely different crib than they thought. And yes, exactly the amount. I mean, it was like to the sense of what they needed. The miracle of being part of this bread prayer is both being the recipient, but can you imagine being the one who wrote that odd check? Like, I don't know why I'm adding 17 cents to this amount. And then hearing, this was a work of God. I remember another season in our life where we got a tax bill where we thought, I don't know how we're going to pay that. Completely stressed by it. Offering it to God. And across town, my older cousin was meeting with my aunt, and they were going through her finances, and somehow he felt impressed to say, I think you should write a check to Mary and Bruce. And it was enough. It was the omer I needed to pay that bill. That's the miracle of walking with God and praying this prayer, both in give us this day and naming all the places of our real anxiety, our real concerns, our real needs for bread, but also praying it like this, that we, that we might be part of God's answer to the need for bread in the lives of others and for those around our world. This has been part of this prayer from the beginning. I was amazed to find this quote from Basil the Great, who like led the early church in the 300s. And this is what he said. The bread that is spoiling your house belongs to the hungry. The shoes that are mildewing under your bed belong to those who have none. The clothes stored away in your trunk belong to those who are naked. The money that depreciates in your treasury belongs to the poor. So we're invited to breathe, to pray, to listen and speak with God, to receive, not hoard. It's going to be maggots and smelly if we do that. To share and to live into this prayer with a trust that God is the one who loves us, provides for us, cares for us. And so, sons and daughters of God, we are bold to pray. Let's stand and pray this together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Friends, we have prayer time. If you have a need, if you want to pray with somebody, please come. But as you go, be blessed and have a wonderful fall break. <laughs>